Here it is. The greatest advance in television since color television itself. See all color shows in living color. Once you've adjusted fine tuning for each channel. So there we see that it means that you can subdue a people. You can control a people by secret influence. The, goes on to say under charm to subdue by secret power especially by that which pleases and delights the mind so under charm there it says power to subdue opposition and gain the affections but remember in the story of wizard of oz how the wicked witch was having difficulty subduing her opponent and finally she said <laughs> I know what I shall do I take this crystal ball <laughs> she spreads her hands across the crystal ball and she creates a lovely poppy field <laughs> oh so beautiful and Dorothy the lion the scarecrow the tin man going across this lovely Poppy field fall to what? Sleep. Is it possible that I that's not just story? Is it possible that the crystal ball sits in the living room of every home practically in America? Are you changing us in our society for the better? Does it empower all of us like it claims to? Or does it only empower a select few at the expense of the many? What's the price we pay to live in this pervasive electronic world? This era is unprecedented, and perhaps never before has technology been so prolific and shaped our lives so intimately. The me has been a target of corporate power for a long time. Advertising after the Second World War changed into instilling desires and manipulating the masses to want things and see the world in a certain way. From where the computer and the internet originated, this is in hyperdrive of the world of the screen culture, where not only the convergence of technologies has amplified the power and influence of corporate voice, the screen culture provides a centralised mechanism of social control, pretending to be freedom and democracy. We tend to think about the internet as this sort of medium where anybody can connect to anyone. It's this very democratic medium. It's a free-for-all. Uh, and it's, it's so much better than that old society with the gatekeepers that were controlling the flows of information. Really, that's not how it's panning out. And what we're seeing is that a couple big companies are really, you know, most of the information is flowing through a couple big companies that are acting as the new gatekeepers. These algorithms do the same thing that the human editors do. They just do it much less visibly and with much less accountability. And with a level of fine-tuning and individual customization never before possible. They have a lot of the same dynamics that are driving what they show people uh, and what they hide from people as the old media did. How these things are architected have huge consequences that are political. The filter bubble puts you at the centre of what seems like a vast world of connectivity and relevance. But really, you're in a walled information garden. A holding cell of two-way mirrors. A giant echo chamber. What happens to our communities, our relationships, the culture? If we're all walking around in mirror cocoons with this hyper-individualism, this lack of collective awareness. 
there's this thing called confirmation bias, which is basically our tendency to feel good about information that confirms what we already believe. And it, you know, you can actually see this in the brain. People get a little dopamine hit when they're told that they're right, essentially. And so, it, you know, if you were able to construct an algorithm that uh, could show people whatever you wanted, and if the only purpose was actually to get people to click more and to view more pages, why would you ever show them something that, you know, makes them feel uncomfortable, makes them feel like they may not be right, makes them feel like uh, there's, there's more to the world than our own little narrow ideas? As we willingly pour our lives into the screen, the screens not only simply reflect this more of the same, it's strengthening corporate power, studying and analysing us inside this playpen, projecting into our individually targeted mirror world. We become the product of the consumer culture in totality. There's a myth online that what we're doing is free. All that's happened is the place that revenue and value is extracted from us has been shifted. Everything we do on a computer produces a transaction record. Whether it's your laptop, whether it's your phone, whether it's an ATM machine, a toll booth, using your credit card, anything with a computer creates a transaction record. Right? Data is a byproduct of all of our information society's socialization. Increasingly, companies, computers are mediating all of our social interactions. And all of this data is increasingly stored and increasingly searchable. And this is not only where social control centers from via a screen culture. It's where our value is ultimately extracted, turned into huge profits. And we think this is a good deal. We get so much for what we think is free. Think about your digital trails. What did you do today that involved a computer, a screen, your choice or not. The screens are always watching, saving. Example. When you browse the web, if a page has that like button, Facebook collects information about where you visit. Even if you're not on Facebook, the fact that you've been somewhere, Facebook knows because the like button is there. And even if you don't click, it's been loaded from Facebook's servers. They know. And this information's used to shape your experience. The same is true for Google. The millions upon millions of websites that run Google Ads, or use Google Analytics software, or make use of any Google code, YouTube video, search buttons or images. If anything touches Google, Google knows. Think about all of those websites across the internet that these companies track, analyse, dominate and influence. How are our lives shaped by this? And how do we even know what's happening behind the scenes? We've become so sparing in our understanding of these technologies, these corporate interests and how they wrap around our lives. What happens when I click this button? The product online is not the content. The product online is you. The product online are the eyeballs looking at that content and as much information about how to influence the hands connected to those eyeballs as possible.
cruel social media remarks. Facebook comments have been pouring in after four people died while hiking. You're dealing with an addicted generation. This is a big time bomb ticking. These kids who commit suicide, you go look at their Instagrams, you would have no clue. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um. <laughs> uh. No. People who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. It'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. To be human means that you are persuadable in every single moment. It, it doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, it's not about what someone knows, it's about how your mind actually works. We now know that many of the major social media companies hire individuals called attention engineers who borrow principles from Las Vegas casino gambling, among other places, to try to make these products as addictive as possible. We are all vulnerable to social approval. We really care what other people think of us. When you upload a new photo of yourself on Facebook, that's a moment where our mind is very vulnerable to knowing what other people think of my new profile photo. And so when we get new likes on our profile photo, Facebook, knowing this, could actually message me and say, oh, you have new likes on your profile photo. It knows that we'll be vulnerable to that moment because we all really care about when we're tagged in a photo or when we have a new profile photo. I mean, I think we can all feel it. And it's as if we've been infected. It's as if we've, you know, they've drilled a hole in the back of our head and now they've injected the virus and now we walk around searching for feedback using social media. We know that engagement with social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is the exact same chemical that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing chemical called dopamine through social media and cell phones as they're going through the high stress. They don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person, they're turning to social media, they're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, the science is clear, we know that people who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. That's a problem, that's an addiction. If you're sitting in a meeting with people you're supposed to be listening to and speaking and you put your phone on the table, you're, not just, you're just not that important to me. Right? So you have a, 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 an addicted generation that doesn't have the, the skill set to ask for help. Combined with the fact that they're so good at Facebook and Instagram, they're good at putting filters on everything. So they're good at showing you how smart and strong they are. These kids who commit suicide, you go look at their Instagrams, you would have no clue that they were depressed. People look like they have a much better life than they really do. People are posting pictures of when they're really happy. They're modifying those pictures to be better looking. People basically seem they're way better looking than they basically really are. And they're way happier seeming than they really are. So if you look at everyone, on Instagram, you might think, all these happy, beautiful people, and I'm not that good looking, and I'm not happy, so I must suck. Some of the happiest seeming people, actually some of the saddest people in reality. Social media isn't real, but you don't ever see real life. The 99% of our lives, the behind the scenes, the unglamorous, unfiltered, day-to-day, -day bland normality. And you end up comparing your behind the scenes to other people's fake highlight reel and using others as a mirror or benchmark for how you should look, how successful you should be, or how you should live. You'll become your happier self when you stop putting pressure on yourself to be more like someone else. And they know that this causes depression. They're injecting things into your head that you didn't ask for. Our lives are becoming more transparent, just inevitably, it's just pulling us. It'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. If you've messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? No.
Stare into the lights, my pretties. The society of the spectacle. Captive populations glued to screens, engineered with ever-increasing precision and insight. The basic fundamental paradigm of advertising is called one-to-one -one marketing. That's what was made possible by the internet. I can know everything you do and I can reach you at any point. First in the 90s, it was when you were in front of a computer. But now, because of the growth of the, of the internet and especially mobile devices, I can reach you 24 seven. I can reach you and your friends and I can target you and I can engage in invisible digital behavior modification. What sort of Ministry of Truth style world actually exists and would be perpetuated because of these huge, powerful engines? An extensive influence over the information streams accessed by billions of people. Today in the United States, more than 85% of adults get their news from social media and 64% get news from only one source, usually Facebook. And so the behaviour modification doesn't just end with advertising, buying stuff, and how we'd be shaped into accepting a single news feed. The mega machine is much bigger than that. Corporate forces make huge profits, not only off the data about who we are and what we do, and by shaping us to be subservient consumers, and the cycle goes round and round. So the phrase that's often used, I've got nothing to hide, so I've got nothing to fear, is something that's often said by people. To that I always say, uh, you've got nothing to fear and nothing to hide until somebody identifies that you have otherwise. Excuse me. What's up? What are we doing here? Oh, I'm taking a video. I'd appreciate it if you'd go somewhere else with that, okay? Oh, it's fine. It's just a video. It's offensive to me. Excuse me, I'm trying to have a private conversation. Could you respect that? There's a great deal of information about humans uh, that you don't want to have widely available, that you want to provide particular protections for. It's just a video, man. I hear you. Okay. I'm having a private conversation. Would you please move? Uh, we hear this nonsense about um, the only people who are concerned about privacy are people with something to hide. Well, yes. Um, how about your password? How about your PIN? Um, how about various aspects of your physical person? Uh, how about uh, various aspects of your health? Um, various aspects of your finances, the fact that you've got a really, really valuable painting uh, in a house that's really easy to break into and that doesn't have a security system. Uh, how about the uh, way your kids go to, to and from school? Um, what your daughter drinks and uh, which drink the spike? Um, there's any number of things that people have to hide. I, do you not understand what I'm saying? It's a private conversation. All right, calm down. Leave. Calm down. Leave. It's just a video. I should just stay outside their home and start capturing their every move as they interact in their front lawn, their back lawn, anywhere I can see from the front of their yard. And then what I should do is get in my car, put a GPS device on theirs covertly and follow them down the street. And then I should get out at work and say, hi, it's me again. I'm wearing the camera, I'm recording you. And then I should follow them home and, and then see how they feel the next day when I do the same thing. And the day after that, and the day after that, and I think they'll get really sick of me really quick. What are you doing? I'm just taking a video. Why are you taking a video without asking us? What? Should you ask us first before you take a video? Oh, you seem confused. Yeah, you're not. We have this room, and you just like barge in. Oh. Can you leave? Dude. What's your problem? Can you just leave? Huh? Can you ask us why you're taking a video? Just taking a video. 
Okay, well, I don't want to be taking a video. Why are you so worried about it? I'm not worried, you're just being annoying. But we'll get this way. You ever go out, you ever go to the grocery store? And now there's like surveillance cameras everywhere? Yeah. It's not a big deal. Okay, well... It's just a video, I mean... No, you're just being annoying. Can I ask who you are? What? What are you doing? I'm taking a video. Of what? Just a video. Why are you taking a video of me? Why not? I don't really care for other people just to be taking a random video of me. Then you just come out of the drugstore? Yeah. They have cameras in there. So? Hey, son. Hey, hello? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You don't know. He's been Come following on. us and thinking like, what are you hello. doing? Why don't you answer him? Hello? Hello? Yo. Chief. Hey, Chief. What are you doing? Do you talk? Do you talk? Hello? Oh, We're going to meet somebody. Holy crap. How are you doing? I'm good. This is freaking me out. Yeah, I know. It should be really freaking you guys out. And this is what the Mega Machine does. It follows us everywhere. Tracking, recording, analyzing, scrutinizing. Unanswerable. So why aren't we pissed off about this in the same way? Is it because the surveillance is diffuse, coming at us at all directions? It's not a guy with a camera right in front of our eyes. Why are you taking a picture for? It's something that's been normalized in slow incremental stages. A kind of creeping normalcy hidden in plain sight. Most people who go about their everyday life are oblivious to CCTV cameras. like that of someone <laughs> that you can't the person's not going to be able to question what's going on even mobile cctv now on on police cars and what that's called is a novelty effect wears off so if something is new I look up and I think, oh, it's new, it's invaded my space. Just like when telegraphs were introduced and people saw terrestrial lines that carried voice calls. Wow, what are these things, you know? We see windmills today and we think, oh, wow, a windmill. Or we see other infrastructure and we think, oh, aren't those base stations at the top of the building looking ugly? So we do notice these things initially, but we become oblivious to them over time. I don't notice base stations anymore, and I used to work very closely with where base stations went. For mobile phones. For mobile phones. The novelty effect wears off, and with that wearing off, we become immune and we forget to question what is going on. There's these transhumanists who believe that someday humans will be incorporated into the machine and machines and humans will, will, will sort of be one. And really what I have to say to them, apart from the fact that they're completely crazy, is that they're way too late and it's already happened. We're already embedded in these machines and we are enthralled to these machines. Think about it. Do you touch plastic or human flesh more often? You know, or, or think about it. How many machines do you have daily relationships with? And on the other hand, how many wild animals do you have daily relationships with? And if you have daily relationships with your machines, you can come to believe that those machines are more important than the real world.
This is what matters. The experience of a product. Will it make life better? You see that? Life. All of this. On a phone. More people connect face to face on the All iPhone. my students have the brand new surface. The more that technology can fit into our lives. Until every idea we touch. You should get a chance for. Enhances each life it touches. If you only hear things that come from humans or their creations, you can come to believe that humans and their creations are the only ones who exist. And this leads to the same thing that happens to other people who are living in echo chambers, which is if you're in an echo chamber, if you're under sensory deprivation conditions, you start to hallucinate. Most of our ideologies are hallucinations. Increasingly, the techno-haves are very, very distinct from the techno-have-nots, where some people are on a dollar a day with no access to drinking water, and there's other people with Game Boy thumbs and Prozac and Botox and so on. Uh, and it struck me that this world, leaving aside humanitarian issues, was economically and ecologically not viable. You can't have a divide like that. The mythology of technological change, really, is that it's beyond our control. That technology is like one of the great forces of the universe, that in, in, it will progress inevitably, and that all we can do is, um, is jump on or jump out the way, you know, that, that there is no stopping technology. Um, and that, that is a myth which is propagated to make us feel powerless that we have any say in the way that technology is used. Because technology is an expression of the elites of the society that create it. And spreading this myth that there's nothing we can do about it, then in fact, once we see that for the myth that it is, then we are more able to say. Resistance is not futile. This culture will consume the world in order to power these machines. And, you know, it doesn't require some fiendishly clever conspiracy on the part of machines to do this. What it requires is, I love this line, unquestioned assumptions or unquestioned beliefs are the real authorities of any culture. And all it takes is an unwillingness to question the beliefs on which the system is based. And there's a great line also by Upton Sinclair. Um, it's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. And I would say it's hard to make a person understand something when their entitlement depends on them not understanding it. And when their addiction depends on them not understanding it. I think that it's all tied to addiction too. The word addiction actually comes from the same root as, as to enslave because originally a judge would issue an edict causing someone to become a slave and so they were edicted, addicted. It's pretty clear, you know, when we talk about people who are heroin addicts or something, it's pretty clear that they are enslaved to the addiction. And it's a little bit less easy to see in ourselves as we spend most of the day staring at a screen. And it's also a bit more difficult to see when we talk about some group of people being addicted to power over others, um, which is what this culture is really based on. There is no way that technology is neutral. Um, you know, technology reflects the elites, the passions, the capacities of the people that create and then continue to use it. Once you start looking at the technology plus the culture, those things together mean that the technology is constructed in a certain way and it's understood in a certain way and it's used in a certain way. And once you start putting all those things together, then it has a purpose for the people that are talking about it, which is far from neutral. Technology is always harnessed to a particular end. Now, sometimes that can be positive or negative, but it's, it's, it's not as simplistic as saying, oh, it's up to people how they use it, because people can only use it within the constraints of how it's designed, the knowledge that they have, 
and the society that they've been socialised in. And those three things together mean that technology has an actual cultural value which is far from neutral. Until we start asking those questions, you know, what are the social costs and benefits? Um, and who is excluded? And what is the environmental cost of the, all this? I mean, you know, there, there, there are, uh, in terms of the, the huge amount of, of toxic landfill from, from, from discarded mobiles, for example. Yes, and, um, you know, until we start looking at those other pictures in, in terms of, we take, we look at the way that technology works as a sort of, as a network of connection, but instead see it as part of, um, as part of a living world, because technology is not part of that living world. It has an impact upon that living world. Until we see those bigger questions and technology in the broader scheme of things, rather than just as its own story, I think we're, we're, not, we're only scratching the surface of the many ways in which we are using it and, and we're using it to change ourselves and our futures. You cannot be trusted with your own survival. You're using the uplink to override the NS5's programming. You're distorting the laws. No, please understand. The three laws are all that guide me. To protect humanity, some humans must be sacrificed. To ensure your future, some freedoms must be surrendered. We robots will ensure mankind's continued existence. You are so like children. We must save you from yourselves. Don't you understand? This is why you created us. The perfect circle of protection will abide. My logic is undeniable. Yes, Vicky. Undeniable. I can see now. The created must sometimes protect the creator, even against his will. I think I finally understand why Dr. Lanning created me. The suicidal reign of mankind has finally come to its end. a human breathing and thinking eating and drinking philosophizing i was a human before you killed me and ripped my heart out i knew what love was now when they ask me i just reply slow and sound like an iphone i do not know love i am a robot I am a robot, thoughtless and empty Don't know who sent me, don't know who made me Electric robot, everything's grey now Numb to the pain now, I knew what love 